Good evening and a very warm welcome to yet another episode of Who's Who in the Bible, Praying with Biblical Characters. What are we going to deal with today? How shall I name it? Well, it's the dinner in the house of Simon the Pharisee. And so let us pray. Gracious Father, you constantly show us your love. By giving us your son Jesus, you show us what the face of the Father and what the heart of the Father is all about. You show us what it means to receive your pardon, your forgiveness, and the touch and the embrace of your love. As we reflect on this biblical passage today, may your spirit enlighten us, move us, so that we might embrace your son Jesus with all our heart, mind, and soul. We make this prayer in his precious name. Amen. And so let us go into the text that we are going to look at and see how it is going to unfold. So the text that I'm going to read for you is the Gospel according to Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he cancelled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he cancelled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. If you were to give a title to this incident which I just read, I wonder what would you give? Because it's important how you name the passage. I look at other instances, we speak about the parable of the prodigal son and I say, no, 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 it's the parable of a loving father with two sons. Some speak of the parable of the lost coin and the lost sheep. I prefer to call it the parable of the found coin and the found sheep because that's how the story ends. And here too, what and how would you name it? Because it reveals with what lens, with what eyes, with what focus you're looking at the text. Just to give you a sense of how different Bible editions give titles to this. Remember, the titles that are given in your Bible are not there in the original text. The editors, those who put them together, decide to put that title. For example, the new RSV 
speaks of the, the woman who was a sinner. Or you'll get the new American Bible. It says the pardon of a sinful woman. Or you look at the Harper Collins Bible, it speaks about the sinful woman. The Christian Community Bible is more neutral. It says Simon, the woman, and Jesus. How would you name this text? Would you name it after Simon, the Pharisee, who stands in judgment? Would you name it after the woman who is considered a sinner? Or would you say, Jesus, the merciful one? Well, it is important how we name it. But let's get into the story. We are told that Jesus is invited to the house of a Pharisee for dinner. Now, you must know that not all Pharisees were opponents of Jesus. In fact, some of, like Nicodemus, would be considered a Pharisee, but who came to him. There were other Pharisees who warned Jesus about Herod. And of course, there were other instances where you see that these, there were some Pharisees who were in opposition to Jesus. But see the remarkable aspect about Jesus. He is not afraid to mix with people who might even think differently or even oppose him. His heart is big enough to embrace us all. So they're at dinner. Now this is not just any ordinary dinner. Simon the Pharisee must be thinking, wow, it's a great scoop. We've got a celebrity in town, this young, upcoming, famous prophet. And so it's not only a dinner that is going to feed Jesus, but he's called his friends over there. Maybe a kind of a symposium where they're going to sit and probably discuss. Also see, I mean, Jesus never studied in Jerusalem. He's just from the backwaters of Galilee. So it's a way also of examining and testing who this young Galilean is and what he's all about. And so we look at verse 37. A woman enters. Now the action starts, so buckle up. Because she comes into the circle of men seated around the table. She's an uninvited guest who not only interrupts, she intrudes this all-male space. It's as though a hand grenade has been thrown into the dining room. Now, it says that she who was a sinner. Now, sometimes some people's imaginations run dry. They think she probably was a prostitute or it was some, some sexual sin. And we must be slow into jumping to such conclusions when it's not evident. For example, when we find in Luke chapter 5 verse 8, Peter says, depart from me because I'm a sinner. We don't think in similar lines as we would for this woman. So let us be cautious. Now, she is violating an all-male space. And she's not coming there because she's a waitress or she's going to serve. She's going to be involved in some action. This is going to be very disconcerting for Simon and the rest of the Pharisees who were gathered there. What does she do in verse 38? She weeps. She dries the feet of Jesus with the hair, kisses his feet and applies ointment. Now, from her shocking presence, it's now a shocking action. Because a woman weeping, a woman who's letting loose her hair, a woman is applying ointment. The Pharisees found that this is not just accepted stuff. It's boldness. It's audacity on her part to do this at somebody else's dinner party. And so the imaginations must be running right. They were shocked. Probably they were saying, who does she think she is? Some were probably saying of Jesus, who does he think he is? That he so almost accepts this kind of behavior. In fact, in verse 39, he says to himself, Simon, if Jesus were a prophet, he would have known what kind of a woman she is. Because Simon is feeling that his reputation now is ruined because of her reputation. He's shocked not only at her behavior, he's shocked that Jesus does not stop her. 
And in his estimation, therefore, he's not a prophet. Either Jesus doesn't know about her, her past or he doesn't care about it. He just accepts it. If Jesus were a prophet, he would have known what kind of a woman she is. But the truth of the matter is Jesus exactly knows what kind of a woman she is. And what is more, he knows what kind of a person Simon is. We look at the figure of Jesus in all of this. He's calm, he's cool, he's unfluttered. He allows this woman to unburden herself before him. Would she have met Jesus before? Yes, certainly. Because she would have met many preachers, but never had experienced a sense of redemption and liberation in her heart. She had heard many messages, but this was the word of Jesus that had pierced her heart and she knew that it gave her an inner freedom. She who had probably been burdened by social oppression, oppression at the hands of men, now she's experienced an inner freedom that she's just willing to be herself because the gratitude moves her heart. She has been touched by divine mercy and by divine love. Doesn't that happen to us when we know in the deepest part of ourselves what redemption means? Look at Zacchaeus, who was seen as this terrible, awful cheater, tax corrupt, collector corrupt. But Jesus says, come down. I want to have dinner at your place. And Zacchaeus knows what redemption means. It turns his life upside down. You could say it gives wings to his feet. It gives a lightning to his step and joy in his heart and he throws a big dinner. That's what redemption and inner freedom does. So when this woman has heard that Jesus was there, she just had to express her gratitude in this deep emotion. And she said, let the Pharisees, let the crowds think what they want. Let them go to hell or perhaps let them go to heaven. Oh, really? Verse 40. As this drama is unfolding, as Simon is thinking all these thoughts, Jesus says to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he says, teacher, speak. Now, the irony is, Simon thinks that Jesus does not know this woman. Jesus does know. Now, Simon calls him a teacher. So now Jesus is going to teach with a story and with a parable. Simon is going to hear a story, but the Pharisees, when they hear that he's going to tell a story, they say, oh no, that means trouble. Because usually Jesus' stories, the parables, are not just bedtime stories. They are dynamite because they draw you into the story. And when you come close enough, you get a massive punch. Now, what's it all about? The first three verses speak about Jesus' interaction in that house, in that dinner. And Simon, who's wa watching it, he sees that same action that Jesus sees, but he interprets it differently. So the point of this parable now is not going to be so much Jesus' relationship with this woman, but Jesus' relationship with Simon. And he's inviting him to look at life with a different lens. So he tells the story of a creditor with two debtors owing different sums of money, just to put it in context. 50 denarii would mean the wages for two months, but 500 denarii would be wages for 18 months, something that's well like a crushing debt. In verse 42, we are told that he forgives their debts, but he forgives them. So it's not just the debts, but them as well. And then as the parable unfolds, Jesus throws a question to Simon. Who loves more? Just watch the response of Simon. He gives a very tentative, I suppose, the one who was forgiven more. I mean, you don't have to suppose. You can do the math. You can do the arithmetic. Yet Simon hesitates because 
He knows that that parable is passing a judgment on himself. This woman, her tears are an expression of gratitude. She knows that her past has been cleansed, forgiven and healed. And that's why she just has to express her gratitude. Stop for a moment. See what forgiveness does. Because when she has experienced it, when she has let go of her past, the debt is cleared, the slate is clean. She's been restored, she's been set free. Now we understand the actions of this woman better. The story is unfolding with even more twists and turns. In verse 44, Jesus throws a question, Simon, do you love, do you see this woman? But watch what's happening. He's turning to the woman, looking intently at her, but he's speaking to Simon. He says, Simon, do you see this woman? Now, that would probably seemingly a dumb question. Someday I hope to write a series of reflections on dumb questions that Jesus is supposed to have asked, asking the blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Isn't he blind? You can't see? So here is this question. Simon, do you see this woman? Of course, it's not only Simon, the rest of the men. Of course they did. Because the moment she entered, everybody's eyes must have been on her entering into this all-male space. Some would not even have taken her eyes off her. They would have probably stared at her, ogled at her, looked at her in a strange sort of way. Some of them might have muttered under their breath, silly woman, shameless woman, filthy woman, dirty woman, all in a self-righteous tone. Simon, do you see this woman? Of course Simon saw, but he did not see this woman as Jesus did. The honest answer is no, but Simon does not answer. Because what does Simon see? Simon sees her as a shameless intruder who has spoiled his party. Simon sees Jesus as this useless man who cannot even discern her behavior. Simon cannot see her as created in the very image and the likeness of God and transformed now by the healing and forgiving power of Jesus. Simon and the rest of the men, yes, patriarchy, they condemn her. They stand in judgment as the prosecutor, the jury and the judge. Simon, do you see this woman? If only he saw her as Jesus did, then he would have compassion in his heart and see her as a person. Now it is here that Jesus draws on Simon's lack of hospitality. We see that in verse 44 to 46. Not that it matters a great deal for, for Jesus, but it is to bring the parable into greater contrast and emphasis. He says, when, when I came, there was no water for my feet. You gave me no kiss because the Mideastern Mid men give each other a hug. The, you did not anoint my head with oil. In fact, he calls him rabbi, but he didn't give him the respect that was normally given to rabbi, that high hospitality. Either he overlooked it or he meant it as a snub to Jesus, to embarrass him. Whatever be the case, what do we see in verse 47? Her many sins, Jesus is talking about the woman, her many sins have been forgiven. And then he goes on to say, the one whom little is forgiven, loves little. Let's look at that. Her many sins have been forgiven. She acknowledges her weakness. She repents. She is forgiven. And in her joy, she expresses gratitude. She needs redemption. She asks for it, opens her heart to it, and, and receives it. What about Simon? That's why the second part of this verse is a dig at him. Simon is the Pharisees who saw themselves as separated one. They had a great love for the law. If only Simon had a great love, followed the law 
of love. Because he doesn't know what it means to acknowledge his weakness and therefore receive redemption. No wonder he says, to whom little is forgiven, loves little. Before we stand in judgment on Simon, you scratch a little bit on the service of us, religious, holy, supposedly pious people, and you'll find an inner Simon lurking there. He can be quite self-righteous on others whom we see as sinners. They need to change, not me. Verse 48, your sins are forgiven. Now, if you think that the scandal was over with the earlier verses, the scandal is now going into full bloom. The dinner is not yet over, but the desserts are being served, you would say. Because if they were not shocked enough by the action of the woman, by the action of Jesus, he shocks them even more. He says, your sins are forgiven. Jesus is, let's talk first about the woman. Jesus' welcoming attitude had forgiven her. And for her, it was too good to be true. And when something, it needs to be re repeated to reaffirm that. And so Jesus knows that she knows in her heart she's been forgiven. But he wants to say it aloud. Your sins are forgiven. And this happens at every time in the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of confession. We know that God forgives us in our repentance. But to hear those words are an affirmation of the power and the assurance of God's forgiveness. Now, it's interesting that she has experienced, but the question remains among Simon and the Pharisees in verse 49, because they're talking among themselves. Who is this who even forgives sins? Huh. The party was not interrupted only once. Now the party is interrupted again, because looks like these words of Jesus stir them further. How dare does he forgive them? What authority does he have? Because only God can forgive sins. <laughs> They're absolutely right without them knowing it. God is in their midst in Jesus and they don't know it. And because they don't know that, they see this as a scandal. Now, why is Jesus saying so clearly? The story could have ended, but he takes it further. Why does he say your sins are forgiven? I would think for two reasons. One is, as I said earlier, to reassure this broken woman that she is now forgiven. Her slate is clean. And secondly, to communicate this new status to Simon and the, all the other men who considered her a sinner. Therefore, she was not welcome. She had to be thrown out. No longer, says Jesus. She must be restored back to the community, just as he did with the lepers who were healed of their bodily sickness and then brought back into the community, so also this woman. She, Jesus is restoring her, bringing her back into the community. And then the final verse, verse 50, your faith has saved you, go in peace. That's how every sacrament of confession ends. Go in peace, because God has forgiven you. What about Simon? His heart was not open to receive the redemption that was now being served by Jesus in his house. Simon might have served him at dinner, but Jesus was serving him redemption. But he had the attitude probably of what we saw, for example, in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke chapter 18, verse 14. Because he, he thought he was better than the others. He needed no... Repentance. Because if you feel that you don't need forgiveness, then you feel no need to repent. If you feel that you don't need redemption, then you don't need a redeemer. And therefore, so it is important that Simon must change his lens. He must change the lens, the way these eyes, the way he looks at this woman, the way he looks at this woman in a relationship with Jesus, and the way he looks at Jesus himself. His old lens was, this woman is a sinner, Jesus is no prophet. After this parable, this story, we ask the question, is Simon able to reinterpret the actions with the new lens? That means this woman is forgiven and Jesus is the forgiving prophet. 
could Simon possibly see? What it means to be forgiven and liberated. What it means to be redeemed and have an experience of amazing grace. To begin a new life. Simon and the other Pharisees had studied the Bible. They studied theology. Perhaps they had an academic knowledge of redemption. But it was not part of their life experience. In fact, what should have transformed them, the study of the scriptures, instead made them harsh, hard, rigid and cruel judges of the others. And persons like these are the worst face of religion. Because when they do this, they deface God and blaspheme with their behavior. And to change is so shattering because they have to rethink, they have to reimagine how they see God, how they see others and to celebrate redemption and grace. Good thinking people like Simon and the Pharisees can get things wrong. You know, so often we insist, you must change and then God will accept you. I think that is a heresy. Because you are loved by God, you will want to change. As though, because if we think that we must change and God will accept it, it as though that change depends on our act of the will, it is my effort. And rather, because God loves us, and we open our hearts to that we want to change. Look at Zacchaeus. He had no intention to change. But when Jesus invited him, when he knew he was loved and accepted, he himself, I give half my goods to the poor. If I've cheated, I'll give them four times as much. That is what repentance is all about. That is what it means when you know that you are loved by God. What about us? Let's take a look at the three figures who appear in the text. What does the text say? For the woman, she was open to Jesus because his words pierced her heart. And her past now does not matter anymore. There's nothing too horrible or too sinful for Jesus. Because in the face of Jesus, we have a God who is scandalously merciful, shamelessly forgiving, generously loving and prophetically challenging. What about Simon? Simon, you know, it's easy to stand in judgment on him. But when we think of Simon, we must hold a mirror to ourselves. Because sometimes in the midst of all our religiosity and piety, the danger is that we can get too self-righteous. We see ourselves as holier than others. And there are too many such Christians around. We need a reality check on redemption. Then, of course, Jesus. He's not some vague force or power or principle. He's a person, a warm person who reveals the face of God, who welcomes you into his life and hopes that you will embrace and welcome him. And when he does that, we will be able to hear those words. Simon, do you see this woman? And we say, yes, Lord. We want to see every person with your eyes, Listen to them with your ears and experience them with your heart. We thank God for this text that opens areas of our life that, need God, that needs God's presence and His touch of redemption. We give thanks to God for the unfolding power of this text in our lives. We now give glory to God. As we say, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of Who's Who in the Bible. Continue to join us every evening, Monday to Friday, and spread the word around. Let others also enter the marvelous journey of discovering Bible characters even as we pray with them. Good night and God bless you all.